<coughs> the agreement when it was reached is that the Worcester and Birmingham Canal would raise the height of their water by six inches. They also agreed to pay a compensation toll to the Birmingham Canals for any, any boat that came through. Okay. Eventually in 1815 they made that physical connection by water. It was made in the form of the Worcester Bar Scott Lock. That's why that section so narrow. It was originally a seven foot wide working lock. It was a lock with only that wide or fall of six inches. The six inch wise on the Worcester of Birmingham means when that lock's been operated, water can only ever run in one direction. It will only ever go from the Worcester of Birmingham onto the Birmingham Canal. It physically cannot run on the foot of hill the opposite direction. And it, it actually, because of all this, that we get the name for Gastric Basin. It wasn't originally known as Gastric. This basin was originally known as Brick Kelp Piss. Because like many things on our canals, it is named very literally. It was surrounded by brick kilns. In fact, it's where they fired the majority of bricks that they used to build the original canal. Its name was changed to Gas Street because of that lock. Even once that lock's been built, it takes time to work boats through that lock. Gas Street therefore becomes a bottleneck for the boats in our city. An extraordinarily busy hive of activity, operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Boats working through locks by candlelight, not a safe operation. So eventually they built a gas works on the opposite side of gas room, just to our left hand side. And in that building they would smell the coal. By smouldering that coal they are releasing those flammable gases. Those gases could then be piped through into gas room basin. Gas Street Basin became the first gas reserve in Afghanistan. It was one of the very first gas reserve in the entire country. So, as I say, like many things on our canals, it is named very literally. It is called Gas Street Basin simply because it was lit by gas lights. So, we're now going to come back through Grindley Place uh, and I'm going to start talking about the history of the Birmingham Canal navigation themselves. And to do so, I'm going to pose and I'm going to answer three questions. Those questions are, why are these canals here? How did these canals get here? Finally, what impact did these canals have on this region? And arguably, this country as a whole. That first question I just posed, why are the canals here? That is ridiculously easy to answer. The canals exist in Birmingham because of the efficiency of transportation they gave us access to. Previous to the boats, everything was being bought in by horse and carts. We'd load a ton, maybe a maximum of a ton and a half of material onto that cart. That cart is then dragged into our city along dirty, dusty, gutted old cart tracks. For that, they'd be using a single horse or a single driver. Transfer onto these boats, we can now get 30 or even 40 tons of material onto this metal. And that 40 tons could be pulled into this city using that same single force driver. So if you look at it purely from the financial point of view, you're bringing it by boats, you will be paying a one man's wage, paying to stay the fee on a single horse. You're bringing it by horse and carts, you're going to be paying at least 30 men wages. You are going to be paying to stay the fee at least 30 horses. Significant savings just to keep it. A second question I posed, how did the canals get here? That is a little bit more complicated. First of all, we need a company that wants to build the canals. The Birmingham Canal Navigation Company was formed by a group of coal mine owners. Those coal mine owners were predominantly from the Black Country region. The Black Country, Bedlam that you speak to, is Wednesbury, Warsaw, Tipton, Dudley, parts of Wolverhampton. About eight miles straight to the canal. I'm not actually going to start any arguments about what the Black Country is. Uh, it's always an interesting one to have to discuss that. Um, personally, I know that Wednesby is definitely part of the Black Country. It's Wednesby that I was born in. Uh, to perform the canal company, the next thing we need is permission to build the canal itself. Because, like the majority of canals in this country, the Birmingham canals were built using Acts of Parliament. Quite literally written into British law to get these canals built. Those Acts of Parliament are multifaceted, but there's two important things that the canal company needs. They need the permission to build. Most importantly, 
they got permission to compulsory purchase the land to build the canal. That compulsory purchase was at a fixed amount that was written into the law. This gave the company peace of mind. They knew exactly how much the land at least was going to be costing them. Concern was if they tried to buy on the open market, they could have come across an enterprising landowner. That landowner realises that they can keep in the land to get this canal built. They could have answered that. Quite the choice of that land to make themselves as much money as possible. We've now got our company, we've now got our permission to build. The next thing we need is an engineer to do the work. The Birmingham Canal Navigation Company approached the same engineer and have already built Switzerland's Canal up in Manchester. Now we've got the permission to build the Canal Navigation Company and we've got the permission to build the Canal Navigation Company. Now we've got the permission to build the Canal Navigation Company and we've got the permission to build the Canal Navigation Company. It's an engineer by the name of James Whitley. Hopefully you recognise that written on the back of our boats with our portrait cruises. Mm -hmm. For the same reason that development to our left hand side is called Winter mm -hmm. Place, we've simply both decided to name our businesses after engineer and build <laughs> And we are currently travelling along that original canal, we've mm -hmm. just turned on to it because we made that last turn. Once again, like many things on our canals, it is named very literally, but this time it's the style of canal that's named literally. The style of canal we're travelling along is known as a contour canal. It's known as a contour canal because it follows the contour lines of the land. The same thing that we see on the Ordnance Survey map. The contour line is your height above sea level. There are squiggly lines on the Ordnance Survey map. The contour canal was chosen as the simplest and easiest canal to build in the early years. Because we don't need deep cuttings. We don't need tall embankments. We can just follow the lay of the land as they say twist and turn our way to keep them to the level. The level that's chosen is the 453. It will take an inch or two depending on lot usage on a day by day basis. The level of our water here in Birmingham sits at 400 feet above sea level. Quite commonly referred to as the Birmingham level. Personally, I don't like that term. I prefer to think of it as the Wensby level. Number one, because I am born in Wentworth. Number two, it was the level of the mine of the Wentworth that dictated the level of the canal in Birmingham. Because it makes sense. Every single boat is going to be loaded at those mines. So you choose the level of the mines. Once it gets into Birmingham, the coal field is completed here, there, and everywhere. It doesn't really matter what the level is in Birmingham. It makes more sense to choose the level dictated by where the mines are. So as I say, I prefer to think of it. It took two years to build. The Act of Parliament was written into law in 1767. So if you went outside before we left, when we say 250 years worth of history, we are indeed correct. Two years is a remarkable achievement. <laughs> So I, did, I did say we're going to be talking to the time. I normally have to think of one we're going to talk to the time. What's happened now is the wind is going to turn the boat. I thought you were saying like... Basically using the side of the canal to turn the boat. Yeah, you do. Stand on the seat. Two years is remarkable. Oh, okay. The original canal was 18 miles in length. And when we then consider that we are digging this canal with pickaxes, shovels and wheelbarrows alone, we've got no, we've had enough people digging for those early years. That true is And when this canal opened in 1769, it proved to be an instant and warming success. The day this canal opened, the price of coal in our city plummeted. Today this canal on the end user is now paying part of the event for their coal that they were working on. Not only is the end user paying part of the event, the coal mine owners are actually making more money per ton at the same time, such as the savings that are making in transportation Not only have we now got ourselves a cheap and plentiful supply of coal within Birmingham, these canals and boats also have to give us access to a high quality seam of limestone and iron ore once again predominantly over in the back of the In fact, to this very day, you can still take public trips on these boats directly into those lines of the current and by the old lines. The past announced trip for our prices to come to the day is the Dublin Canal. 
little bit dignified. I'm not going to lie, I've got a lot of shows in the back and shows in there. But it's really, <laughs> this boat physically doesn't fit. This boat will not go into the water tunnel. It's too tall. So you go into those boats, you go into those cabins in those boats, which means you have to wear hard hats as well. It really, it really is a tough trip. Limestone, coal and iron ore are three key ingredients in the production of iron. So I can now bring us on to the impact of these boats and these canals had. We can now truly make the statement that these boats and canals help to kickstart the industrial revolution. All those years ago. It did not take long for the industrial revolution to start biting back on this region. After only a few short years, this region gave voice to a new saying. And that saying was black by day, red by night. We are black by day, essentially because we're burning all this coal. The lime kiln, the limestone, fired by coal. The smelting pots, the iron ore, fired by coal. Let's not forget, almost every home in this region is going to be heated by coal in those years. Burn all this coal, it's just close proximity. Let's be honest, the coal we took up in the Midlands certainly wasn't the cleanest burning coal in the first place. All we ended up with was a heavy form of pollution. The pollution sat over this region of smog. Smog restricted the daylight that was able to reach us. We are black by day. We are red by night. The coal fires, the light kilns, the smelting pots are operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our horizon is therefore glow red in the evening. We are red by night. Pollution also gave rise to what we call this new pollutionary twist. We've got a moth in this country it's known as the pepper moth. The pepper moth resides predominantly on the silver birch tree. Silver birch trees in this region are simply known as the silver. They've got a light of sun on them. Pepper moth changes its colours to match the tree. The change it to being a white moth and a black crackle, it can change a black moth and a white crackle. Our industry declined and our air quality improved. Silver birch trees return to being silver, the pepper moth return to being a white moth. So to stay fast, the evolution can actually work. Less than 200 years we evolved a regional subspecies, switched it back to its original colours. But it actually stays a regional subspecies. It was so far removed from its original genealogy, even though it's come back to the same colours, it's still a separate, distinct species. <laughs> Anyone's wondering what I was just doing there? Um, in case you haven't figured it out. Give up. Who's driving? Chris. Chris is driving us in the back of a 70-foot long vessel. As much as he would like to be able to, Chris cannot see round corners. This is a bit of an awkward junction, because anything coming towards us would be coming out of that left-hand tunnel. That means that we would not see them until we're literally out on the main road. So I'm just basically yeah, acting yeah. as Chris's eyes and ears with any thoughts of the boat. I don't legally need to. Yeah, legally, we have got right of way putting on to this main line. Very different to the roads in this country. The reason for this is essentially because what a lot of us are, are single-handers. When I'm operating my boat that I live on, I've not got anybody inside to be able to walk to the front for them. Anybody already on this main line is going to see the front of my boat way before I see them. So it's their responsibility to avoid me. However, it doesn't matter what the legalities are, I've got a beautiful bunch of people on this boat. If we get hit side on at full speed, it's not a pleasant experience. So we just post somebody in the front just to make sure. Just on our right hand side, the lining of our canal is changing. We've got the original heavy duty coping stones. Unfortunately, we've got a boat board against the lake of concrete. Um, once the concrete comes to an end, we want a brick line section of the canal. So at this point of the trip, I always say the same thing. I'm also actually going to take a seat on my own boat, so I don't get to do very often. Always say the same thing at this point of the trip. Pay attention to changes. If you see something change, if you see something unusual, we can always discover the history behind it. That layer of concrete, that's actually the original line of the change between the contour canal. So that contour canal used to come out of use of street loop, the same as we've just done, used to go off on the right hand side. Underneath these flats built over the canal in the late 1980s. 
that was to stick to that 453 foot contour level to that simply following the lay of the land. The brick line section that we're currently on, well this tells us we are now on our new main line canal in Birmingham. We've got two main lines in our city, we've got the old and the new. And I must, must admit it does make me giggle that we still refer to this as the new main line canal, even though it is now over 200 years old. This came about because that 1769 canal became a victim of its own success. Kickstarted the industrial revolution, it then got very busy very quickly. These canals were the motorways of their day. A lot of the motorways of today, they did start to get congested, both holding each other up. By 1820, it was a serious and significant issue. So serious that the Birmingham Canal Company decided to approach probably this country's most famous engineer. I don't think I've ever said this engineer's name without a single nod of recognition from somebody down the boat. That engineer's name is Sir Thomas Telford. Truly one of this country's most prolific engineers. And he came up with a number of solutions for us. First of all, significantly wide is our canal. We are nearly 80 feet wide on certain sections of the new main line. That is opposed to the 20, 30 foot of the original. Widening the canal in this manner, however, does not mean that we're putting more boats on the water. We're not stacking next to each other trying to race down this canal. What it is doing is significantly increasing the water carrying capacity. This is very important. Birmingham is built on a hill. That means that any boat that comes on or off the Birmingham level uses a lock of water to get here. And each time you use a lock, you are taking water off the Birmingham level. So what Thomas Selford is doing by increasing the width of the canal, he's increasing the water carrying capacity, he's reducing the impact of each use of the lock. Or in other words, he decides to use the canal as a reservoir for itself. It's a very elegant, very ingenious solution to the water carrying. The next thing that Thomas Telford does, I will come on to very shortly. But in order to do so, I'm going to ask everyone to use our imagination for a while. We are going to pretend we do not have a diesel engine having these boats. We are being pulled by horses and roads. And our horse is currently walking up and over the humpback bridge to our right hand side. And that means we've got a tight rope between the roof of our boat and that horse's neck. That rope is currently being dragged over the handrail of this cast iron bridge. Have a look at this handrail. Have a look at the damage, the grooves cut into that handrail because those grooves have been caused by hundreds and by hundreds of horses pulling these boats along these towpaths. The ropes get wet, the ropes pick up grit. It's the grit that's caused the damage to that cast iron grid. Truly amazing how much damage has been done. Shows just how many boats were using these canals during that industrial revolution. And it brings us very nicely onto the next improvement, Sir Talbot made. Because that improvement is something that makes us very unusual here in Birmingham. We have got a towpath on both sides of our canal. Previous to this, like the majority of canals in this country, we did only have a single towpath. And a single towpath is absolutely fine, so long as everything happens to the group in the same direction. As soon as we meet a boat in the opposite direction, also being towed by ropes, well, one of those ropes is going to have to be untied. We're then going to need to manhandle that rope either over or underneath the boat we are passing. Once again, you did hear me correctly, they did pass the boats underneath the boats. Because before the days of diesel engines and propellers, we've got less to catch on underneath than we have on a load of towed So you need to pass the boats underneath. One of those boats is losing time, one of those boats is losing energy. It's going to cost money, essentially, to get that boat back up to speed. For that reason, it certainly wasn't unheard of in those early years of canal boating for the working boatmen to have physical fights on the towpath about who's turning one to the side. They also used to fight about who's turning one to go through the locks as well. Put a towpath on either side of our canal can also introduce a rule. That rule is quite simple. Our os will always be on our right hand side. That means the boat we know passive, their, their os is now walking towards us on the left hand side. We've no longer got issues crossing the road. I've just realised I was saying os, really. 
Yeah, yeah. Everybody, I, I'm assuming everybody knows. I'm just standing black. <laughs> hey, does anybody know what a striped arse is? No. Separate that. Striped arse. I think that Thomas Tapper does is fairly significantly change the character of our canals. We're just at a perfect point to compare the two styles. That is James Brindley's contour canal just going off on our left hand side. To compare the narrow and twisted nature of that canal as it disappears around the bend. Compare it by standing up. We've not got many people on the boat. And looking straight down the line of the boat. We are now on the almost narrow straight section of the canal. Thomas Telford takes advantage of our advancements in our engineering capabilities. 50 years has brought us a long way in this country. We can now dig the deep cuttings. We can build the tall embankments in Cleveland to pull the Thomas Telford used the new, the old main line to build his new main line. Because what he did is figure out where those cuttings needed digging. The navvies would start digging there first. They'd be digging down, leaving the soil to either side. Once they've reached the 453 foot level, fill the canal with water, drag a boat up that canal, load that boat with the soil and leave it to the side. Once that's done, all you need to do is simply drag that boat around to where you need an embankment building. Empty the boat, build the embankment. Once again, very elegant, ingenious solution. Thomas Telford chooses a new main line straight down the centre. The James Brindley Contour Canal still intersects us over and over and again, all the way down that line. We now refer to those as our loops in Birmingham. The ooze on street loop we came through earlier. That's essentially the James Brindley Contour Canal for the Thomas Telford improvement intersection. Thomas Telford, not 10 miles off the journey. So the original James Brindley Canal was 18 miles down to the back of the Dicton. Following the Thomas Telford improvements, we've got a journey of only eight miles. <laughs> when we then consider that the maximum speed on these boats is around about four miles an hour, we can do the maths. You're not 10 miles off the journey, you can save two and a half hours off each and every single trip. Most of these boaters are doing the round trip a full boat from the mines in the black country, empty the boat in Birmingham, and taking an empty boat back to the black country to be fair once more. They are saving five hours off that road journey. In those years, that is almost half a day's work. Massive savings. Massive savings. Just about to make a left hand turn, we're going to pick up the Ignil Port Loop, so I, I definitely need to be in the front of the boat for this one. Because you are about to see, we are going to take up not only the entirety of this canal we're turning off, but we're going to take up pretty much the entire canal we're turning into as well. They did really did build these canals to the exact dimensions they needed. It means we're going to be travelling underneath this cast iron bridge relatively slowly. Have a good look at the bridge, it is the original. This bridge was cast by Thomas Asprey and Sons in Smedic. It's about four and a half miles straight up the canal from here. Installed in 1854, the only maintenance it's ever needed is a lick of black and white paint every few years. It is in remarkable condition for its age. Highlights the quality of iron we did produce in this region, during the industrial revolution. I think Chris is loving this, he doesn't, Chris normally drives for one of the other companies who doesn't post a look out at the front, <laughs> so he's actually quite enjoying the fact that he can make his turn. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Telford is And as we finish our turn, I'm just going to point out that something very strange is about to happen to the tow path on our left hand side. It follows us, follows us around the corner to around about 70 feet. Uh, it then gets blocked by a brick wall. The other side of the brick wall, the towpath appears to disappear entirely. This is actually what is happening. The Neil Port loop we have just turned on to is even more unusual than the twin towpath mainline. Because this section of our canals in Birmingham is to have no towpath at all for over 100 years. The reason for this this section of our city used to be completely filled in with industry. So all you would see around here is factories and warehouses. When the age of the horse-drawn boat came to an end, replaced first by steam, followed by the diesel engines we use today. 
the, larger, the companies round here simply no longer needed the towpath. All they now need is a loaded one. They need somewhere to get the boat tied up to get it unloaded and reloaded again. Over the years, the towpath fell into disrepair. Eventually, the decision was made to remove it completely. By removing it completely, they are significantly increasing the security for the industry that is about there. Because no one can get through a back door. Well, I can't be breaking into it, can I? So, a massive increase in security. I am sure you guys on the boat are more than intelligent enough to have figured out that this is in the process of changing. We are going to get public access over the island. We are currently looking into the Ignil's Port Loop development, currently being advertised as Birmingham's only residential island development. And it is actually a true island. It's an island that was created by the James Brindley Contour Canal. We are currently travelling along the intersection of the Thomas Dalton Surrounded on all sides by canal water. The Ubisoft on after they are building 3,500 new homes. They are also building some commercial activity. There will also be some tourists that have leisure. And if anybody is looking into there as confused as I was when I first heard the three and a half days in the new homes, how on earth are they going to squeeze them all into there? Well, the true answer is they're not. Because the development is actually both sides of this canal for its entire one kilometre. Truly a huge development taking place. I quite often refer to it as the third city being built here in the second city. No one's from Manchester, are they? <coughs> so I've not just heard that. Probably Manchester is one of the kind of the second city these days. Certainly they're not. <laughs> Section we're just about to go into, very reminiscent of what this entire area has felt like for the last five decades or so. The industry in Birmingham was in decline. The businesses were closing down. They were leaving their buildings empty. You even build an empty round here for any length of time. The vandals turn up. I do believe the common tab bridge is around about 30 seconds before they realise that the building's empty these days. Then they let off the roof, they smash your windows, they kick your doors in. Your building is no longer watertight. A non watertight building very quickly loses structural integrity. This entire section of Birmingham has felt very much like a waste ground for the last five decades or so. And you probably know, Chris, we do have quite a bit of graffiti here. Um, personally, I have got no issue with true graffiti art. Um, I do believe that these artists are valued. I cannot abide the taggers. The guys that just turn up and bite their name, that is the absolute annihilation of our heritage. I actually used to work for the waterways. I used to work for British waterways. And around about 10 years ago, we spent about 25,000 pounds cleaning up one of the bridges, cleaning all the water off. They are also grade two listed. We had to replace it with live water. Literally, we finished work at half past four for one night. Went home, came back in the next day to find that the entire thing had already been covered. Empty time. Heartbreaking to do. Heartbreaking. We're just coming up underneath the Ignilpool Road bridge. We're going to pass underneath this same road twice in very quick succession. So our loop just brings us out of the very end. We're going to go and get underneath the same road. We can actually already see the next of Thomas Dalton's improvements in view. And I always love this point where people are trying to figure out what I'm talking about. Not only did Thomas Dalton use the canal as a reservoir for himself, he did film true reservoirs as well. That grass bank driving up in front of us, that is human constructed earthen dam that is Ed Bastard Reservoir. Originally built as Bottom Park Reservoir, named after the deer hunting ground it was placed. We've got nothing left of the deer hunting grounds in Birmingham anymore. Simply known as Edge Bastard Reservoir to this day. Still doing the job designed to do 200 years ago, feeding water down that brick slope just to our right hand side onto the Birmingham level. Pretty much a permanent feed because of the lock usage we have in Birmingham, we are pretty much permanently feeding water onto our level. We 
just going to pass a baby cabbage and a little cottage, colloquially known as the BCN Cottages. I know it didn't look like much from the side aspect. How glorious is it once you get the front aspect? An absolutely stunning building. I adore those arch windows. Absolutely adore Colloquially known, as I say, as the BCN Cottages, built for the staff of the canal navigation company to live in while doing their job. The person living in that cottage would have been the reservoir manager and it would have been their job to manually monitor the water levels of the Birmingham level. They would have done so by running out of that door on a daily basis, literally with a ruler. And with that ruler they would measure the freeboard of the canal. The freeboard is the distance between the water level and the top of the towpath. You measure that distance and the same place on a daily basis, you compare your records to the day previous, you now know whether you've got more or less water on the Birmingham level. You now know whether you need to open or close the feed to that level. Yeah. Will not surprise anybody to find out that these days we monitor our levels automatically. The electronic system called SCADA. However, what probably may surprise you to find out that the feed to that reservoir is still manually operated. Not only is it still manually operated, it is the original feed the original equipment that was installed by Thomas Talbot over 200 years ago. <coughs> Unfortunately, the next thing I'll get to introduce you to is not pleasant. It is the killer of our heritage, in particular historic woodwork in this country. It is the vegetation growing out of these walls to our left and to our right. The vegetation is a plant named Budlia. It's a non-native invasive species. Like many of our non-native invasive species, similar to Himalayan balsam, Japanese knotweed, Budlia, um, brought out by the Victorians. As an ornamental plant to their garden. You can't blame them. They did not know the impact they were going to have. In fact, it's because of the impact that we now know that that had, we've got the biosecurity measures in place in our ports and airports to this day. Budlia, it's a wonderful habitat for butterflies. In a few weeks' time, these bushes will be teeming with butterflies, and these dead cone-like flower heads on the end are going to be an absolutely beautiful, stunning moment. <coughs> Unfortunately, although it's wonderful for butterflies, it starts growing as we can see in the mortar between the brickwork. That crap is getting bigger and bigger. That didn't even, that, that crap didn't even exist for really. it. We're very hopeful that the developers get to knock this down before it falls down. <coughs> because, as I was saying about Budlia, starts growing in the mortar between the brickwork, it will stop crumbling the bricks apart. Twofold effect this slopes to the canals. Clearly, once those bricks come out of those walls, it's close to the water, it's only one place they can end up. That's been it, bottom of our canal will slowly get too close to the top. At that point, we can no longer navigate the <laughs> yes. Talking about navigation through Birmingham, that boat shouldn't really be existing on the Birmingham level. It is a 14 foot wide boat. Our locks in Birmingham are built to a 7 foot width. The reason we built to a 7 foot width, <coughs> the water, water conservation is a top priority. We're built on the hill, we need to keep the water on the level. The bigger the lock you build, the more water you're going to use to get a boat through the lock. So we decided on the seven foot wide lock from Birmingham. That boat literally doesn't fit. It doesn't go through the locks to get here. It literally does not even fit through the bridge hole that we've just come through behind us. What they did is crane that boat into the water. They used that boat as the sails and the marketing suites for the development before they've completed any show home. Now that they've got the show homes completed, the boat is now a community centre and coffee shop. It is borne onto a large one acre communal garden. 
What are three gardens uh, due to be built on the development? In those gardens, they are hosting events. They've had street food events, they've had music events, they've had poetry readings, they have had storytelling. If you share a postcard with that boat, if you share a postcard with the garden, like well, yeah, you can live in one of these new houses and you get free tickets to those events. You get free coffee and cake every Saturday morning inside the coffee shop. The intention behind this is the developers know that these are new houses. People are moving in without knowing anybody. So the developers are spending their own money putting on these events. They are encouraging the neighbours to come out and get to know each other. Enjoy a concert together, enjoy a cup of coffee together. Actively encourage the community to be developed rather than leaving them in individual selection of houses. A very refreshing thing to see from the developers, in my opinion. Well, I'll say that, it was very refreshing right up until the point that the developers went into administration in August last year. Building work has been at a complete standstill for the last eight months or so. Although literally within the last week they brought all this equipment back on, something is happening again. It looks like they're preparing the groundwork for the flat that it is for It's actually also quite refreshing as somebody relatively local. As I say, I'm not, I'm not from it, I'm the black country. But it's actually nice to be actually be able to buy something around there. Because almost 80% of what is being built in Birmingham at the moment is what is called build to rent. Investment companies only. Even if you've got the money, even if you could afford a mortgage. I certainly couldn't afford a mortgage for one of these. Even if you could afford a mortgage, you literally cannot buy them because they are being built for investment purposes only. Not quite sure what they expect us to actually do, where they expect us to live in Birmingham, to be honest with you. talk a little bit about the decline of our canals, what caused that decline and how we managed to turn it around end up with this wonderful leisure resource we have in the modern era. In order to talk about the decline I'm just going to ask everybody to look out of our left hand window and very briefly. And we can see the electrification of that parallel running mainline railway to our mainline canal because it was indeed the coming of the railway age that started the slow gradual decline of our canals all those years ago. The reasons, once again, is efficiency gains in transportation methods. If you move from 40 tonnes on a boat at 4 miles an hour, you're going to get at least 10 times that load onto a train. That train is moving at least 10 times the speed. We've still only got a couple of members of staff. They've got the driver, they've got the boiler. And in case anybody's wondering, yes, I do consider the force. And if you've travelled this country a fair amount, you may have noticed this is not just in Birmingham that our canals and railways are running parallel. The same is replicated up and down this country. The reason, once again, is efficiency. This time, the efficiency is the build. Because we've already levelled the mandate to get these canals built. The embankments are dug where they're needed. Sorry, cuttings are dug where they're needed, the embankments are built where they're needed. We've even driven the tunnels through the hills where they're required. Why do those areas ever so slightly? They down two miles and got the train tracks. Happens to be the quickest, easiest way to get them built. Once again, it's a business. Also, happens to be the cheapest way to build it as well. Nationwide, these boats could not compete with the efficiency of rail. Simply no longer commercially viable. However, in Birmingham we were fortunate. We were fortunate because the Birmingham Canal Navigation Company yet again proved to be formidable. They saw this potential competition coming and they figured if we can't beat them, we will join them. And they took a large shareholding in the Great Western Railway Connection. Not only that, but we built up to 70 interchange basins. We're just passing one now, the Monument Road Basin. And as we look into that basin, you can see we've got a spur off the main line canal and it's alongside a spur off the main line railway. So what we did here in Birmingham is take advantage of the efficiency of rail for that long haul journey. Load the train in London, bring it up by rail into our city, pull it off to the interchange basin. And in that basin we would unload the trains, we would load our boats. Our boats in our city continue to make the final mile delivery. 
to the factories and the warehouses. So we actually kept our commercial viability for the nuclear contract. The factories and the warehouses had already got their own loading walls for the boats. Clearly, for practicality's sake, they can't do it have their own mailbox. Just coming up on our right hand side, we've got a humpback bridge over nowhere. Now, Victor Park Trade Centre used to be a two thirds of a mile long private factory arm feeding the local steelworks. And I do sometimes get asked why they don't knock that bridge down and make it easier for the cyclists. I find that quite a weird question. It's a 250 year old listed structure. Let's not knock those things down just to make it a little bit easier for somebody on the bike. What ended the commercial viability of our canals in Birmingham was actually the improvements of our boarding infrastructure. Because once it became more efficient to make that final mile delivery by lobby than it was by boats, those private arms got truncated. A truncated canal is a canal you stop the water going up. Once you stop the water from going up, they filled those canals. The factories, the warehouses in Birmingham essentially changed their boat parking over to lobby parking. We no longer have commercially viable. By 1948, our canals were not commercially viable any longer, but they still need to be maintained, particularly the canals that have been built onto the embankments. If you stop maintaining that canal, it is eventually going to breach. That water is going to flood out. You know? In 1948, the majority of our canals were privatised, uh, nationalised, sorry, taken into government control. The British Waterway Board was created. The original intention to slowly close down the non commercial viable canals. Luckily, we've got a few enthusiasts <coughs> appear on the scene at the same time. One of the best known is a gentleman by the name of R.T. Waltz. He's even better known, in fact, as Tom. And Tom, upon his retirement from work, converted an old working narrowboat. That working narrowboat's name was Cressy. Cressy became what is considered to be one of the first full-time Liverpool boats in this country. Tom then travelled around the 2,000 miles of England waterways we've got remaining. He wrote a book about the journey. And that book upon its sail did a very important thing. Because that book rekindled the public's imagination. Made us realise what a wonderful, beautiful, precious leisure resource. Not only is the majority of us in this country got almost directly on our doorsteps, but one which we were about to lose forever in its entirety. Eventually, the British Waterway Board dropped the board section of their name, becoming known simply as British Waterways. And then 12 years ago, does everyone remember David Cameron's Quango smashing? Let's take everything out of government control. The canals is actually the only thing that he actually got followed fully through on. So although these canals and these towpaths are still publicly owned assets, each and every single regiment of this country owns a little tiny proportion of these canals and towpaths. They are now managed on our behalf by a charity. That charity's name is the Canal and the River Street. Talking to charities, we're about to head back under through Vincent Vincent Street Bridge. St Vincent just happens to be the patron saint of charities. Always think that's quite a cool thing to mention. And then as we come through this bridge very shortly, we are going to be seeing my favourite building remaining within the city centre limits. It's an absolutely stunning bit of architecture. Stunning bit of architecture that was actually built by means of an architectural design competition. Somebody literally won the design this building, won the right to build it. Built originally in 1874 by the City of Birmingham Corporation, essentially the precursor to our city council. And I know I am talking about the building before we can even see it. It is going, it is going to start to appear as we clear this pocket flat on our left hand side. I have to talk about it before we can see it, because we just don't get to see it for very long because we don't pass. As I say, built in 1874, it was built stabling on the ground floor with offices and warehousing above. It's just going to start coming into view for those at the very front of the boat. It's going to start coming into view for those towards the back end very soon as well. And now it's coming into view, I can tell you that it's a building that we call the Roundhouse. The building that we call the Roundhouse 
because it's bad. <laughs> Simple as. It's actually a horseshoe, to be perfectly honest. As we come through past these gates, you'll be able to look down into the little courtyard. That courtyard is spectacular. The courtyard is cobbled. The courtyard is multi-leveled. The courtyard is circular on the inside. One of the most stunning bits of architecture you've ever seen. You've got a perfect guy there just showing us what's going on. <laughs> If you've got any spare time while you're here with us in Birmingham, I would definitely recommend a one day around to that building. We made a better five minute walk from our morning. Half an hour to an hour's dedicated time is all you need. Words cannot actually describe the courtyard. You have to see it to understand what I'm talking about. They've also put a little museum, built a little museum on the middle floor. So I've opened a little car shop in there as well. Definitely for a walk, yeah. Well, it was used to stable, so we've actually got a couple of different ways our motors would use our stable box in the city. First of all, we've got the local motors. That's those guys that are making that final mile delivery in this region. They would stable their boss overnight and all their boats overnight. We attach the same boss to the same boat the following day. We've then got the fly motors. The fly motors ply their trade almost exclusively between the cities of London and Birmingham. It is a long, arduous journey by boat. The cities are separated by 144 miles of canal. We are also separated by 166 locks. The last time I made that trip by boat, it took me two and a half weeks. I was travelling for five hours a day. The fly boat has made the trip in 72 hours flat. They did this in two ways. First of all, they got priority through the locks. It didn't matter how long you've been waiting if a fly boat turned up they saw that lock Secondly, they would be operating 24 hours a day, they would never stop moving. So clearly they would have to use the stable box differently. Because when they got to a stable block, they would actually be switching their horses and their staff over. Take on fresh legs. We're going to slowly wend our way between some mud roads. We're going to bring ourselves back towards the morning, coming past the National Indoor Arena. Yes, I am aware that it's no longer officially called the National Indoor Arena. But as somebody that's relatively local, I have just got sick to the back teeth over the last few years and trying to keep up with all the silly, ridiculous This is the National Indoor Arena. The NEC is the NEC. I refuse to think of it anymore. It does mean though that we are looking forward to coming towards the end of our tour. I, I do hope you've enjoyed the sights and I do hope you've enjoyed the history. And if you're not local, I do hope that the Amnium accent has a great opportunity back on anybody on the boat. I am aware that the fact that we are taught to speak proper in the Midlands can wind people up. But whether you've enjoyed the trip or not, we always appreciate feedback, whether that is good or bad. Good feedback means I can go to bed tonight feeling all warm and fuzzy about yourself. Poor feedback means I can grow my business. We are a new company, we've been going for just over a year. And we are willing to learn the mistakes we think we are making. Friendly Cruises is our name. We are TripAdvisor our Google and Facebook if you could help us out in that respect. We are also available for private hire. We can have a two, three or four hour party on this boat. Once I've fixed the PI, we do have a custom install safe system. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, we've got a fully licensed bar, which I should have told you about earlier. I might have made some more hard earned money on that. Yeah. Never thought about that. But most importantly, have a safe, safe, pleasant journey back to where you're going. Please remain seated until we've fully tied up securely and I've put the step back on the front. We can sometimes come in after the time back when you follow the morning night. As I say, I'm supposed to be the rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of the back holiday. Thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure to have you. Have you seen that place over there? Yeah. I met an American diner. I met an American diner. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Stop. Nice food there. I think, I think, I think that's the one that I went to. It was a one by the canal. No.